still okay. So welcome back. We have been uh, dealing with a severe thunderstorm here in the Orlando area in the villages. And so we were knocked out. Our uh, internet was knocked out for a few minutes and we are just able to now come back. So we were looking at Genesis. I'm going to continue. The father's out here talking loud and he's speaking. <laughs> Praise the most high. Thunder's the father's voice. So we are here and the father's letting us know he's here and he's hearing what we're saying. And we hear, praise the most high. So we were looking at Genesis. We had just finished chapter 15. And I'm going to skip over 16 and go right to 17. Genesis chapter 17. I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 9. Genesis chapter 17 from verse 1 down to verse 9. We're we'll continue. We're studying the epistle of Paul to the Romans. We're in chapter 4. And we're going over Abraham before we continue. Abraham. So Genesis chapter 17 from verses 1 through 9. Genesis chapter 17, 1 through 9. I'm just going to get right into it because I don't want, just in case we get interrupted again, I don't know what the father going to do here, but we're going to get right into it, all right? Genesis chapter 17 from verse 1 through 9. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, Yahweh appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am Al Shaddai, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will establish thee, excuse me, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and y'all talk with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be the, a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham. Neither shall thy name be any more called Abraham, but Abraham, for a father of many nations, I have made thee. Now, I want to say Ab means father. Abraham, okay? That means father. Ab means father. Abraham is like a multitude, a father of a multitude. Whereas Ab means father. Abraham. Aham means multitude. It's like that end part, Kam. Ham, like, his, like, like Sim's brother multitude. And that's why his name was Ham or Kam. Why? Because he had Cush and Cush had Nimrod and Nimrod established kingdoms, right? Abraham. Like you ever see Buckingham Palace? Buckingham Palace? What is that? That means it is a multitude of towns. It's a town, right? Buckingham, right? So Ham, he says, Ab, I'm going to make you father of multitudes of towns. Multitudes of towns. Abraham. So I'm changing your name to Abraham because you're going to be a father of nations, he said. Okay, let's continue. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful and will make thine, make nations of thee. Kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a most high unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be there most high. And Yah said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant therefore. Thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. So you're going to keep your covenant. He said, Abraham and his seed. I'm promising this land to your seed, Abraham. You cannot get any more plainer than that. I'm promising this land to your seed. I've counted you as righteous and I'm going to bless your seed. And that's why when we study Deuteronomy, the father through Moses says, I'm not doing this for you. I'm not bringing you into this promised land because of your righteousness. It's because of my promise to your fathers, Abraham among them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My promise to bring their seed into this land. And today, as we are returning to the God of our fathers, as the Father Spirit is awakening us to come to Messiah to be brought again to Father in righteousness, he is awakening us to fulfill the promise. 
to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bring his seed into that land, to make his seed a multitude of nations. And that's where we are right now. The tribe of Judah and the southern kingdom of Judah and Levi with Benjamin has been scattered into the Caribbean, into the U.S. The 12 tribes, the 10 tribes of the north have been scattered as the Indians have been scattered throughout all the earth. And it's a multitude of nations. And he's going to bring the seed to the promised land. He's going to fulfill his promise. If you understand and believe that, you know, if you're reading the word of the Most High, you, you're studying this word, and you understand and believe that the Father is going to bring the physical bloodline seed back to that land, then you must, the question would formulate in your mind, who is the bloodline seed? Now, to the gods of the other nations, they have made up their own bloodline seed, as we know. They have made up their own religion. The Abraham created this religion called Judaism, they claim, and that's the seed that they claim of Abraham. But that's a man-made religion and a man-made seed. We are the children of promise, the ones brought out of slavery. And we were brought out of slavery before, and we know all about slavery because we were brought out of the house of bondage of Mizraim, which is Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And we have been put into bondage again because of the disobedience of our fathers. So we know we are the seed. And the seed is going to be brought back to the land that was theirs by promise. So that is going to happen. The 12 tribes, remember we studied it, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of, of Israel, the northern tribes are going to be brought back into harmony. Ephraim and Judah are going to be one stick again, according to Ezekiel. And his promise to Abraham will be fulfilled when he brings us into the promised land and he is sanctified in us and he brings the heathen up when he say I'm going to bring you up among the heathen and I'm going to be sanctified in you in front of the heathen so that they will know I am Yahweh that is now happening that is happening now okay we are now being awakened we are being brought back to the word of the father. We're being reintroduced to our father through Messiah. And we're being prepared to inherit the, seed, the land that was promised to our seed. Messiah is our cousin. And I'm not, you know, you know, I'm not joking when I say that. He is our cousin. Abraham is our great grandfather. That will never change. That is a fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. Now, that promise is fulfilled in the promised seed. The promised seed that should come is Messiah. That's what Paul said. Messiah is the promised seed. The land is to the seed of Abraham, his children. And it says it with thee. I'm going to, he says it here, and, and we just read it. King shall come out of you, Abraham. I'm going to establish my covenant between you and thee and thy seed after you. In their generation, their multiple generations, multiple seed for an everlasting covenant to be a most high unto thee and to thy seed. And I will be their multiple, their God. Now the promised seed that he said, Isaac, that promised seed is Messiah. The prophet that I will raise up from among the brethren of the Israelite nations, like unto Moses. Moses was a Levite, but this promised seed that's prophet, priest, and king is of Judah. Judah is the lawgiver. Okay, so he fulfills all his promises. And, and now we are now witnesses, you and me, are witnesses that he is now fulfilling the last part of this promise to prepare us and bring us into that land. And he's going to take over this planet. The whole planet. He's going to take it over. See, 
the CIA, FBI, NSA powers of whoever that's listening to me, they, they're laughing now. And they can laugh. Yes. The God that I serve, Yah is his name. He is sending forth Messiah, the seed of Judah, to take over this whole planet. Not just the United States. There will be no United States. There will be no Russia. There will be no China. There's going to be a kingdom. And all y'all, the seeds of those places, they're going to have their children there with garrisons from Israel. And he's going to take over the entire giant planet Earth. And he's going to reconstitute it because it's been touched by pollution. He's going to fix that. He's going to fix that. Okay. Exactly. So, I, so, so it's all good. They laughed at Abraham when he said a flood's going to destroy the earth. They laughed at him. A flood's going to destroy the earth. They laughed until the flood came and destroyed them all. Okay. So I'm saying to you, you don't have to worry about me. I'm not going to take up no arms and march on Washington. But my cousin, my cousin, he's coming. When my cousin come, our big brother of the tribe of Judah, he's taking over the whole thing. He's going to destroy the whole thing and take it over and give it to my, my children, my, my peoples, his cousins. He's not playing. And, and we are ambassadors for him. You know the Bible calls us ambassadors, right? We ambassadors. Be ye reconciled to our father. Who's our father? The only true God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The only true God. There is no other. And no, the Baptists don't serve him. No, the Jehovah Witnesses don't serve him. No, the SDAs don't serve him. No, no, no. The Pentecostals don't serve him. The Catholics don't serve him. No, none of them serve him. They got their own God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of the awakening children. We are the seed. Who is that, you say? Who is that? Who is in the holes of them slave ships? That's them. Who is in them teepees when y'all came over killing them and taking over? That's them. The Taino, the Mayans, the Aztecs. That's them. The West Africans, you call them. That's them. That's them. The ones that are now in Sudan and Ethiopia, that's them. That's them. Oh, you laugh. Keep laughing. All good. See what I'm saying? Let them keep laughing. All good. Laugh. Go ahead. Enjoy. We're waiting on Father Yah to send Mashiach. And I'm telling you right now, we won't have to wait long. 2027 is coming up in five years. And five years after that is 2032. We're not going to have to wait long. The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of the Ingathering, the Feast of the Harvest is coming. And Mashiach is going to lead it. Praise the Most High. We don't have to worry about that. It's a spiritual battle that we're dealing with right now, brethren, because we have to be ready in the spirit. Spirit got to be ready. We got to be ready in the spirit. In order to be ready in the flesh, you got to first be ready in the spirit. Okay? Praise the Most High. Establish his covenant with Abraham, or he changed his name to Abraham, and to his seed after him forever, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Exactly. The father was trying to prepare our fathers in the wilderness to inherit the land. He was trying to prepare them in the spirit. His spirit was following them. He provided water and he provided bread for them. But they were in the flesh. They weren't prepared in the spirit, nor did they surrender to be prepared in the spirit. Therefore, they could not, in an 11 day journey took them 40 years. An 11 day journey took them 40 years because they would not be prepared in the spirit. 
their children were ready to go in. And Joshua and Caleb led the children of those people into the promised land 40 years later, 40. Coming on 2027 is a jubilee in the fall, in the Hebrew fall, in the Hebrew 2027. That would be the 40th jubilee since Messiah. The 40th one. Testing. We were tested 40 years in the wilderness. Our fathers were tested 40 days in seeking out the promised land. Messiah fasted in preparation for his mission 40 days. Moses on two occasions went to the mountain to meet with father 40 days. Elijah, when he was running for his life from Jezebel, went without food for 40 days. This is the 40th Jubilee 2027. In the fall of the seventh month and the 15th day of the month of the Hebrew calendar, 2027. Five days later, after that date, I'm sorry, the seventh month, the 10th day of the month, excuse me, the seventh month, the 10th day of the month is the Jubilee 2027. Five years later in prophetic time is 2032, the harvest, the end gathering. And Yah may cut it short in righteousness because he might make a short work on the earth. We don't have long. We don't have long. It's coming. We are witnesses. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And y'all say, we are serving Yahweh. Okay, Joshua said, you are witnesses that you said, I'm going to serve Yahweh. He said, we be witnesses. We be witnesses. Praise the most high. Praise the most high. Yes, he can do a short work. That means I'm talking long term in terms of what's going to happen when I say 2032. Y'all might decide at any time to end the whole thing. He could do that. That's I'm not y'all. He can do that anytime. He decides. It's father that tells Messiah, go. Messiah doesn't take it upon himself to jump on his horse and go. Father says, take them priest robes off. Put the king robes on and go. And he's been ready. He was ready in 1844. But then the angel said, hold up. 144,000. Israel is not prepared. And you can't come unless Israel's ready, according to the promise. Israel is now getting ready. There will not be a second delay. There will not be a second delay. Praise the Most High. Okay? Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, Romans chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 1 and go down to verse 4 of Romans chapter 4, from verse 1 to verse 4. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before Yah. For what saith the scripture? Again, he's referencing what? The scripture. In Paul's day, what was the scripture? What we are calling the Old Testament. So he said, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed Yah, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now let's, let's break this down. So if Abraham performed some sort of work, Yah would owe him something. Yeah, okay? If, if Abraham performed some sort of work, Yah would owe him something. So that the promise would not be a promise. It'd be something that was owed, like a debt, like Yah, you owe me. Never, brethren, does the creator owe you anything. Never does he owe you anything. See, that's part of the problem. Those of us in the awakening, 
can see those are the people of the majority that are not in the awakening. And one of the things they have in common is they have what? Let me just say it. Y'all know what I'm about to say. Y'all ever heard of privilege? And you can add a color in front of it. Privilege. Privilege. Y'all say, y'all see how the majority act like they entitled? Entitled? Like it is owed to them? They have privilege and entitlement. When we are servants of Yah, we understand Yah don't owe us nothing. See, that's the difference between those that can point their finger at Yah and claim this and that, and those that humbly serve Yah. The humble understand He don't owe us nothing. It's through mercy and grace we receive anything from Yah because he don't owe us nothing. And that's what Paul is saying here. Abraham wasn't owed nothing. Father gave it him as an act of grace. He believed in the Most High and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He performed no act that, that, that made that righteousness be a declaration. He just trusted what the Father said. And it was an act of grace that he was saying, I'm going to count you as righteous because you believe my word. Don't ever think the father owes us anything. He don't owe us nothing. He never does. It's through an act of grace and mercy that we receive blessings from the father. And he is willing through, obviously, by sending his own son to pay the penalty from the tribe of Judah, sending his own son to pay the penalty. He obviously cares. And obviously wants us to inherit promises for sure. And he wants us to trust in his promises. That's what the Bible says. When we trust in his promises, we become partakers of a divine nature. When we trust the promises of Yah, as Abraham did. Abraham trusted his word and it was counted to him for righteousness. Not that Abraham of himself was righteous. He was counted. He was blessed. And that's what Paul's getting ready to explain. So he said here, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If it's something that is owed, Abraham, then you owe me. You ain't do me no privilege. You ain't do me no favor. You owe me this. No, father don't owe you nothing. Abraham understood that. Now, verse five, let's go from verse five down to verse eight. He's now going to quote Psalm 32. He's going to quote Psalm 32 from 5 to 8 here. In Romans chapter 4 from verses 5 to 8, Paul is going to, is going to quote uh, uh, Psalm 32. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom Yah imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh will not impute sin. So the blessing comes as an act of grace. And that grace is given when you perform one thing, faith. You believe in the Most High. You trust in the Most High. You repent to the Most High. Faith. All of that are acts of faith. When you repent to the Most High, that's an act of faith. He receives that. And counts it to you for righteousness. He receives that. When you believe his word and you don't waver off his word, he counts that as righteousness. He don't owe us nothing. He blesses us with his grace and says righteousness. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, this movie, this thing, isn't it? Praise the most high. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh will not impute sin. He doesn't count you as a sinner when you are repentant. And trusting in his word, he counts you as righteousness. Praise the most high. And he does it through Messiah. Without Messiah, he couldn't do it. But he does it through the sacrifice of Messiah. That body, that body, that covenant that Abraham was entering into with the dead animals. Guess what them dead animals represented? Messiah. Through the blood of Messiah, he said, you can count on my word through the blood of my chosen anointed one, Messiah. You can count on my word through the anointed one. 
Okay? Count on my word through him. He's the promised seed. He is the surety, the guarantee of the body, the covenant. See how silly it is for people to try to claim Jesus nailed the, the, the commandments to the cross. There's no more law. See how stupid that sounds in light of what it costs to uphold that covenant? Cost everything. Okay? Romans chapter 4. So now he's going to ask a question in verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say, for we say that faith was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. So he's now he's going to he's going to reel in the Gentiles. So we now understand that the promises was to Abraham's seed. But he's saying, well, can the Gentiles receive this? Can the and remember now in the New Testament when they use the term uncircumcision, they're referring to Gentiles, the heathen. When they use the term circumcision, they're referring to the Hebrews. So he said. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Verse 10. How was it then reckoned? How was this righteousness given to Abraham? Was he circumcised when he received the declaration that he has received righteousness when he counted as right? Was he circumcised when he was declared righteous? Let's look at it. Verse 10. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Uh, not in circumcision but in uncircumcision. So while Abraham was uncircumcised, he was declared righteous. While Abraham was uncircumcised, he was declared righteous. It wasn't until after that that the sign of circumcision was given. That was, see, we read chapter 15, but it wasn't until chapter 17 after Abraham was already declared righteous, that he was told to circumcise himself and his, and his foreskins of his children. Okay? So Paul is bringing out the point that while the circumcision or the Hebrews, the sign of circumcision is in their flesh from Abraham, Abraham himself received this blessing while he was still uncircumcised. That opens the door for blessings of righteousness to come upon the Gentiles, right? So now that's what he's going to point out here, verse 11 of Romans chapter 4. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed to them also. So now he's a father, not only a physical seed, but of faith. He's also the father of faith because as he was receiving the seal of righteousness in the, as a circumcision sign, he had received it when he was still uncircumcised. So that way people that are not circumcised, Gentiles can receive the promise through faith. So Paul is now reasoning the Gentiles can receive this promise through faith, okay? Paul, being a circumcised Hebrew, is teaching Gentiles who are uncircumcised how they might be counted righteous. Let me say that again. Paul, who is a circumcised Hebrew, is sent to teach uncircumcised Gentiles how they might be counted righteous. Does that make sense, y'all? So he knows himself as a circumcised Hebrew, you know, that through faith in his cousin Messiah, he's counted as righteous. But now he's telling Gentiles, you are in uncircumcision. Let me tell you how you can be counted as righteous before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can enter in through faith. That is why he stresses, Paul, <clears throat> that Gentiles do not need to be circumcised. He stresses that in many of his epistles. Why? Because the promise of circumcision was to the bloodline, not to the non-bloodline. But both bloodline and non-bloodline receive righteousness from the same father. But the bloodline is part of a promised seed of Abraham that's going to receive the land. 
but the Gentiles are also able to be grafted in through faith and receive righteousness also. Does that make sense, y'all? And that was Paul's commission to go to Gentiles and, and give them the message of justification by faith. Okay. Praise the most high. Okay. So I'm going to read two more verses before we stop for the day here. I got somebody with a flashing light in front of this house here. So I think we might get interrupted. So before we do, let's go through these next two verses. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So there's two phases of this here. There's the phase that initial that of, of being declared righteous that Abraham received from the father when he was not yet circumcised. Then there's the phase of the promised seed, which had in their flesh a sign of the promise of righteousness through the bloodline of Abraham. So you have those that are not of the bloodline receiving righteousness and those that are of the bloodline receiving righteousness. Those of the bloodline are Abraham's seed, his bloodline. Those not of the bloodline, listen, are of the faith of Abraham. Does that make sense, y'all? So you have those of the faith of Abraham through faith and those that are the bloodline of Abraham by faith. Okay, so both can receive the important attribute of righteousness. Praise the Most High. Okay, both can receive the important attribute of righteousness. Both. That's why he says there's no difference because both can receive righteousness. But there's two factions. There's the factions of bloodline and there's the factions of non-bloodline. That's always going to be, brethren. There's the factions of bloodline and the factions of non-bloodline. Okay. And the factions of bloodline receive it by promise of their family, the fam. And those that are not of the fam through faith of Abraham, the same faith, justified, though they be not of the bloodline, grafted into the olive tree of the bloodline. Okay? Grafted into the olive tree of the bloodline through faith. Okay. Again, I'm glad we're going over this again, step by step, because there's so many misconceptions, so many uh, erroneously taught doctrines from Romans. It's amazing. It's one of the most beautiful things in all the scriptures being, well, it makes sense that it should be so perverted by, by, the, enemy, by the enemy of soul, by all of these different uh, gods that people are worshiping. But when you really look at it and look, notice what we did. We went back to Abraham and we connected Abraham here at Romans chapter seven. You see that? We connected Abraham with Romans chapter 7. And prior to that, what do we do? We connected Deuteronomy with Romans chapter 3. Did you see how we did that? We connected Deuteronomy and Joshua with Romans chapter 3. See? And we just connected Abraham and Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 with Romans chapter 4. See, so you don't have to say that, well, this is the old Testament, New Testament. No, no, it's the same thing. And you see the complete picture when you bring them both together. And brethren, I want you to always remember this, please. There's always a New Testament and an Old Testament sister. They're, they're brethren. They're, they're like sister. They're like related. There's always two witnesses, one on both sides to a doctrine. We talked about um, uh, two or three witnesses to every doctrine. Well, Paul basically is, you know, uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, Timothy, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians. Those are all Paul's writing. That's just one witness, though. You go, and then all of that, as we saw here, you can go. David. He used David as a witness. He used Abraham as a witness, right? The mouth of two or three witnesses. So you got Paul, David, Abraham, and then in chapter three we got Paul, um, Joshua, and Moses. Three witnesses. 
Okay, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Make that a always remember that's a foundational because brothers and sisters, I just want to tell you, I have been called to teach this word so some of you will be future teachers. That's my calling. I'm just declaring unto you what the Father has given me. I'm being told to teach future teachers. You brothers out here that are hearing me are future teachers. Not too distant future either. Read this book. Read it. This is your book. This is your family history. This is your textbook. This is the book you're teaching from. Read this book. And so here's a principle. Two or three witnesses. Always have two or three witnesses. Paul's a witness. You can find Old Testament prophets. Like I said, we done went through David, Moses, Abraham, witnesses. Okay? Joshua was a witness. Choose you this day who you will serve. Witness. Always have two or three witnesses. Sometimes you could have more than that, as we know. You could have more than that. Lots of prophecy witnesses. Praise the most high. So that's a always, brothers and sisters, when a doctrine comes to your spirit and you're believing the most high is showing you something, always find two or three witnesses to justify the doctrine. Otherwise, it may be just you. That's how you can know it's the father if you get two or three witnesses. Okay? For the 144,000, John's a witness. Malachi's a witness. 144,000. Daniel's a witness. Okay? Many that turn... The, those that turn many to be righteous shall be as the stars forever and ever. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Okay? So you get two or three witnesses for everyone that you believe. Somebody was asking me, so uh, you believe that the Messiah was apparently in AD 27? I said, any doctrine I teach, I have two or three witnesses to back up. I don't just teach anything that I just believe. It's got to be two or three witnesses. I don't just make stuff up and think that it is because I saw a verse. It's got to be two or three witnesses. So brothers, please, sisters, too. When you're teaching other sisters or you're teaching the young kids, two or three witnesses. Brothers, when you are being prepared now to be teachers of Israel, please, two or three witnesses. Always bring out two or three. Don't just come with some verse that you ain't got two or three witnesses to back up. Right. <laughs> Two or three witnesses. Okay. As we and we try to do it. In fact, it's a rule. I do it every time we teach, as you notice. I always bring out two or three witnesses. Okay. Praise the most high. All right. It's clearing up now. <laughs> Storm is past. The father's voice has silenced. But he spoke as we were teaching to let us know he approves. I told my wife, he's just letting us know we here. We in Florida. We here. You know, it's 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 um uh, it's amazing. There was a movie with Denzel Washington, and uh I think it was Equalizer, Equalizer One. And this dude came from Russia and he was busting heads. And somebody asked him, What are you doing? He said, I'm sending a message. He said, What's the message? I'm here. <laughs> when you hear thunder. Father sending a message. What's the message? I'm here. Praise the Most High. I'm here. Praise the Most High. May the Most High bless you and keep you. He cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom.